so hello welcome everyone to our fourth fair focus webinar it's great to see so many of you join us today my name is Catherine david i'm head of commercial partnerships at the fair trade foundation so it's my job to grow the market for fair trade products and to help businesses build better partnerships with farmers and workers in their supply chain today we're going to be discussing what businesses can do to uphold human and environmental rights in their supply chains and we'll be recording today's session. I'm joined by two exceptional speakers, um, by Monica Romis, who's the Human Rights Private Sector Advisor for Oxfam, and by Tuti Nahi, who's Fair Trade's lead on business and human rights as part of our Centre of Excellence. Tuti plays a leading role in strengthening Fair Trade's international advocacy work, business partnerships, and also our internal processes on business and human rights. And she's also an active member of the Finnish campaign for a national HRDD law. Monica at Oxfam works with companies to improve their policies and practices related to human rights in their supply chains. And until quite recently, Monica was also working on the supermarket scorecard for the Behind the Barcodes campaign. So has a lot of insight into businesses and especially retailers and their human rights strategies. And Monica has also done research on development and worker rights, which has been published um, and, and peer reviewed in journals. Um, so between them, huge experience and knowledge in the field of human rights and supply chains. And I am super grateful to both of you for joining us today um, to share your expertise and answer some of our questions. And of course, Thanks, Catherine. Um, nice course, to be I'm here. Joined, really good to have you guys. Um, I'm also joined by all of you who've, who've taken some time out to join us today. And you yourselves are experts in sustainable business, activists for fair trade. Um, students looking to understand a bit more and you're all really welcome today. Um, I'm going to ask both our speakers some questions, but I really welcome questions from you all. Um, so please do join in by typing in your questions or your observations. Um, I'm also going to be um, asking a couple of poll questions and to warm things up on this very cold and misty day in, uh, in lockdown London, um, we're going to start off with a couple of poll questions. So Jacob, um, my trusty IT uh, support is going to pop up a question, so please do pop in some answers to those. Um, so, fair trade. Human rights have always been at the heart of fair trade. Um, we work in supply chains and regions where human rights um, are at greatest risk, um, because that is where we're most needed. Um, we believe that all approaches to human environmental rights need to recognise the complexity that farmers and, and workers are living in. Um, and we also think that poverty plays a really um, critical role in creating human rights uh, vulnerability. And, and we're going to be exploring some of those areas today. So I'm going to go to you, Tuti, for the first question. Could you tell us a bit about what fair trade experience has been of human and environmental rights legislation to date? And, and what kind of impact you've seen on farmers and workers of some of the changes in recent years? Well, overall, I think I'd start with, uh, the, the, we are hopeful. We are hopeful. Uh, we think that this, uh, the legislation on human, human rights and environmental due diligence has a lot of potential. Um, um, that's, that's what we hear from also our fair trade staff members who are working in Latin America, Africa, Asia. Uh, you know that we have uh, hundreds of people on the ground and they are telling us look uh, this framework uh, this thinking can help farmers and workers and they are building the capacity of fair trade farmers and workers to participate in these processes in this dialogue on human rights and environmental due diligence so so we are we, we are looking forward but this is not really strictly speaking answering your question because you are, your question was what have we seen so far and and there well so far the impact is quite limited uh, the un guiding principles on business and human rights uh, is soon a decade old but the uptake has been quite slow um, even when research is done on how the world's biggest 200 companies have done human rights due diligence the result is well about half of them do something that we would qualify as HRDD uh, here we is not actually fair trade it's corporate human rights benchmark CHRB which is also operating out of London so so um, 
going forward, what's really important is that this process of human rights and environmental due diligence is taken as, as a process that needs to lead to deeper shared understanding about human rights and environmental problems in supply chains and the root causes and how to tackle them together. I'm just laying this out here as a basis for our discussion because I think at the moment HREDD is still so new that it's been interpreted in many different ways in different companies. And we are seeing practices that we are very hopeful with and then practices that seem more like business as usual. And this, this may be a difficult question to answer, but do you mm -hmm. think, what do we hear from farmers themselves? And so, mm. I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in people we often think of as being some of the most vulnerable, most disconnected from knowledge and information in global supply chains. So what, if anything, mm. do you think smallholders understand or experience of relatively, this relatively new field um, of HREDD? Well, first we are hearing <laughs> what's so new in this? Haven't we, I mean, they, they, they recognize that they, you know, 30 years ago, fair trade was established because we identified a salient human rights issue, which was lack of decent standard of living uh, for smallholder farmers. That was coffee farmers in Mexico over 30 years ago. So that was identifying a salient human rights issue and then since then we've been at it trying to tackle it so our farmers are saying what's the news but when they hear hey this is this is a global consensus that indeed companies have a role on human rights issues that that previously we knew people have rights and governments and states have a duty to protect people from the violation of those rights but we didn't have any consensus of what the role of companies actually is but now since 2008 we have the understanding that companies are to respect human rights and in practice this means they need to companies need to commit to respecting human rights they need to identify what the salient human rights issues, the biggest human rights problems are in their operations and supply chains. And then they need to focus on those biggest problems and seek to reduce those problems together with other supply chain uh, actors. Then farmers and workers, they start to get interested. They start to think, wow, so is this the time when we could tell about our problems like child labor without being penalized, without losing our business partners, but being able to collaborate with our business partners in tackling these issues. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, and Monica, from your perspective, your experience at Oxfam, um, at working with businesses on this topic, do you think things are improving? And, and, and kind of what are the, what do you see as business best practice in, in this space? <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, maybe briefly, I, I just wanted to, to say my, my perspective from Oxfam because I worked in two different capacities and it might be interesting to understand. As um, Catherine said, I worked in the, on the Behind the Barcodes campaign, which is a, a campaign targeting supermarkets in four countries, in the UK, but also in the US, in, Netherlands, in the Netherlands and Germany. And there were really, um, Oxfam research exposed the root causes of uh, um, the human suffering of workers and farmers that are producing our food. So um, I worked on that campaign um, targeting supermarkets to change their policies and practices and to adopt um, human rights due diligence. Uh, and then more recently, while the campaign is still going, although I moved to a different capacity, which is the Oxfam um, Business Advisory Services. There we give uh, advices to companies that come to us with questions about how do we make, how do we take this more robust approach uh, to human rights risk in our supply chains, and we give advice in a number of areas. So, I, I see I'm seeing things from two perspectives, and um, I am a little bit hopeful. Uh, things are improving, but very slowly. <laughs> like I think it's con congruent with the, what uh, Tutti was saying. Uh, from the campaign perspective. Um, we were really shocked how much behind the food retail sector was on taking responsibility. Um, it took a really long while to 
to put human rights on the agenda, on the discussion with them. Um, it, it just, it, it wasn't the, the way uh, they were thinking about it. Um, but the conversation has started and, uh, and uh, we're seeing some signs of progress. Some companies are taking uh, a high road and are uh, really implementing a more robust human rights due diligence uh, process, others not so much. Um, and same thing with what we're seeing from the Oxfam Business Advisory Service, um, OBAS, um, companies are increasingly coming to us with two specific questions. One is, how do we make our strategy, strategies more worker-centric? Mm -hmm. uh, so specifically about workers, a little less about farmers right now. Um, this is also another trend that is happening in, in the world that I'm seeing. But, so, but anyway, like, how do we engage really workers? How do we establish that kind of dialogue with workers, representatives, unions, et cetera, which is super encouraging. Uh, and the other trend is um, about gender inequalities. So we're seeing a lot of uh, um, demand coming from, from companies trying to uh, address, address gender inequalities and women, women's empowerment, um, understanding like, how do we apply a gender lens to everything we do because we obviously are not doing it right. Um, and again, and this is the, the companies that come to Oxfam to ask this kind of advice, you know, are a self-selected group of companies, very <laughs> illuminated and um, progressive thinking, but still it's a sign of progress. Now thinking about what are best practices or like what are the, the yeah, the things that um, some of these leading companies are doing, uh, as I was saying, some of them are doing um, human rights due diligence in a robust way. And what it means is that they really, um, um, engage meaningfully with stakeholders and especially with rights holders, mm -hmm. unions, uh, workers, etc., uh, in a way that they weren't doing before, in a way that others are not doing, because that's really the key. How do we identify your potential uh, adverse impact? You need to talk to the affected people. Uh, so that's uh, one of the, uh, the best practices that we're seeing. And then following that, uh, some companies are taking a closer look at specific issues to identify the root causes that um, are directly um, linked with their own practices. And so many of them are doing human rights impact assessment. Mm -hmm. And from Oxfam, we've been supporting some of them, uh, which is, you know, um, again, a deeper look at some of the issues that come out from the due diligence process and you just investigate a little bit more. And the more important thing when they do it right, it's really to understand the linkages between the company's own businesses practices on the on the affected people. So that's a, uh, that's a trend that we're seeing more and more companies are doing that. Another uh, best practice uh, is uh, to be more transparent, both with, with companies' policies, but also from about the suppliers, the, where they source products. Um, that's kind of all my, uh, now the norm in the apparel sector. Many companies uh, list the suppliers. It was a bit less uh, in the food sector. Uh, with the exception of uh, 60 major brands that um, published their uh, supplier list. Um, and then retailers like Waitrose and Max and & Spencer. And now with our campaign, we uh, gain some momentum and some others are doing like Morrisons and Lidl, et cetera. Um, then, as I was saying, gender inequalities, uh, also like companies that are starting really working on that are taking the lead on this aspect. And just by doing simple things like g gathering disaggregated gender data from their audits or from you know, the, the type of information they collect, they start seeing the problems that affected, uh, affect more disproportionately women. And then um, an, another kind of like leading approach is for when companies start uh, addressing the issue of living wage mm -hmm. uh, and understanding that even when workers gain a minimum wage, they can still be trapped in poverty. So what are the steps they can take? And so we're seeing a little bit more uh, interest towards that issue and some some interesting action taking place. Um, There's so yeah, much in this that I want to pick up on, but but just 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 kind of what just out of interest. So the, the little poll that we just did here, there was like complete consensus by people on this webinar that businesses have a responsibility. So that seems to that seems to imply this is now just accepted fact. Businesses have this responsibility. The kind of debate about is it business or is it government is kind of over. It's both, but business have have this role. Monica, do you, do you think that, you know, this kind of leaders and laggards thing that you always see in, in any part of, of, of business, is your sense that now that we've sort of passed the tipping point and that, that the number of businesses that you're engaging with is growing and that, and that therefore you see this as a signal of, okay, not everybody is doing it kind of perfectly yet, if there is a perfect, but 
everybody now is accepting that this is something that isn't is no longer optional is that is that your sense yeah in some ways uh, i think well yes in some ways yes especially when you talk to companies to the sustainability teams for sure that's the answer that you get yeah and when you go to the commercial team <laughs> things <laughs> change. um and it's in the, the problem, you know, there are, uh, there are many problems, but I think the fact that the sustainability team, teams and the commercial teams sometimes work as silos and they're not well integrated um, are uh, hindering this, okay. this process, right? Mm. Uh, and um, yeah, go ahead, Suti. Would we see this increasing trend of companies speaking out in, on, you know, in favor of legislation as, as a sign of this tipping point? Because, you know, um, well, in Finland, we had a really wide campaign for national HRDD legislation. We had over 70 companies in that campaign, together with trade unions and NGOs, uh, calling for national law to, 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 to clarify that companies indeed are responsible for respecting human rights. And for us, that was huge. We didn't think, I didn't believe that. I've done advocacy work in Finland for 15 years. I didn't think that would happen. We, we were hopeful, of course, that's why we asked companies to join, but that over 70 of them did. To me, that was like, okay, this new era of partnerships, it really is here. <laughs> and then the reason why we got so many was because they kept coming in. We didn't ask anymore, but more and more companies heard about the campaign and clearly found thought, ah, oh, we want to be in it too. We are no worse than our competitors. We, we want in too. So, so and of, I know that that is happening also in many other countries, uh, companies speaking out. I think that's meaningful. Do you think? What I, do you think, I, Monica? I agree. I agree. No, that's really meaningful. When companies speaking out, it, it's a really good sign. And we've seen that also in some advocacy towards some governments. We, we had a letter to the Thai government in seafood last year, and the food retailers all came to, to sign it. So that's, I think, you're right. However, <laughs> my skepticism comes <laughs> from when I, you know, I've been for the campaign, I've been reviewing many of the policies that um, mm -hmm. companies have and they, you know, they endorse the UNGPs, they want to do it. But then, for example, they rely on social audits, like then it goes back to business as usual. So there's still something that needs to be changed. And again, you know, I think the sustainability teams do great jobs. It, it's like they have, we have their complete buy-in. It's like everything else in the company probably needs to change, but um, I am hopeful too. Yeah. You know, I, I see a change for sure from the campaign. We saw a, a, an increase mm. in, uh, in people taking on more responsibility for sure. Yeah. And, and yeah. Tuzi, coming, coming a bit into sort of fair trade approach on this then, because I'm sure a lot of people mm. have joined today because they're interested to understand kind of what fair trade does um, mm. to support farmers and workers to, to kind of understand and claim their human rights. So the point mm. Monica was making about, the stakeholder engagement part of this, but also, yeah. I guess, the role of certification schemes um, in this area, because, I mean, I think it's pretty clear, you know, also from what Monica is saying, is that just doing an audit can be mm. a, bit, a bit tempting um, for, 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 from a business perspective. So could, could you maybe tell yeah. us a bit more about what fair trade does and, 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 and their perspective on, the, on that side? Absolutely. Really glad to also, because there are so many... <sighs> misunderstandings, genuine misunderstandings, but also political claims here. Uh, uh, so to put it out really clearly, certifications and HREDD are no competitors. Uh, HREDD, HREDD is, is a process of, of understanding and then mitigating the human rights and environmental risks and adverse impacts that a company is having. And every company must start doing it. Certification can be one partner and tool in doing that process, but we are not a substitute for it. That's really important to understand uh, <laughs> uh, because, well, for one, uh, each company also has many operations and many supply chains that, that don't fit into any one sustainability initiative. But then, of course, when it comes to the supply chains that fair trade certifies. Um, well, firstly, uh, when we speak about human rights, uh, a fundamental issue is 
is, is, is the dialogue with rights holders and rights holders little by little gaining the capacity to, to, to have a voice and, and identify their issues and find partners to address those, those problems with. And that's the idea that fair trade has been built on from the very beginning. We support and guide farmers and workers to get organized collaborate with each other and get a better status in negotiating with business partners and also better standing in the society to change also local laws and others uh, and, and circumstances, social norms. So, so this human rights thinking is at the heart of fair trade. Uh, of course then, uh, we are also the only certification that that has uh, sort of clear uh, clear systems for improving farmers and workers livelihoods and non-negotiable minimum minimum prices and premiums uh, decent livelihoods are a fundament on on which that that is necessary for human rights fulfillment without sustainable livelihoods uh, so much is at risk. Farmers and workers really cannot take proper care of the environment if they don't have food on the table. Children don't get to school if, they, if, if there is no, opportunity, no time to take them there and if they are actually needed to, to help at the farm just to get enough food on the table. So Sustainable livelihoods is a fundamental issue and that's what we are about. We also have quite solid systems for um, quite solid criteria on the environment. Um, we work on child labor and forced labor issues through standards and producer support and programs. We are there, we are present there on the ground. We are not just a code of conduct and social auditing. We are actually in Africa, Asia, Latin America, working with farmers and workers. So um, I think um, when a company starts building uh, a system for human rights and environmental due diligence, Many consultants can help a lot in setting up the process. But when you come to the stage of, of, okay, now we know some of the salient human rights issues. We know some of our problems. How do we actually tackle them? Mm -hmm. Then companies need partners who are present on the ground. It can be development NGOs. Um, Although I think development NGOs often have the challenge that then the project might be quite local. I think certifications can be a, a really good partner. Oh, let me qualify that. Ambitious human rights based certifications can be good partners for scalable interventions that mitigate human rights violations on the ground. Um, and then I also want to say really openly, uh, fair trade is also working a lot to strengthen our own systems. Uh, for example, uh, our transparency and our sort of tracking system, you know, step four of the HRDD process <laughs> um, should be much better. We should be able to tell much more about, about our impact. What is fair trade changing on the ground? Um, it's not a small challenge when you work with 1,400 producer organizations and you don't demand them and command them to do the same thing, all of them, but, you, but they are rights holders who have the freedom to to, to identify their problems and focus on their problems. So it's, it's a huge issue of data collection, data management. <laughs> but we are working really hard on that. Uh, it's, it's, 
it's among the number one issues in Fairtrade's next strategy. So you will hear more about this. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. There's a lot in there I want to unpack, but one topic I definitely want to come back to you because you both mentioned it is this, um, what I think might be a chicken and egg thing mm. around um, poverty, low incomes and human rights, human and environmental rights, I guess, but human rights. So uh, as a, not, as a non-expert, I can see both arguments that people who are able to uphold their rights um, maybe that leads them to be in a better economic position. But I can also see, I think what you were just saying to you, that um, yeah. if you don't have that economic position to start with, how do you claim your rights? Mo Monica, what's your, um, what, yeah. like, what, what, do you accept the premise that, that poverty, like tackling poverty needs to come first and then rights are on top? Or is that simplification? What's, what's your, uh, what's your sense? <laughs> Interesting. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't see it that, that way, I guess. Um, I think they go together because, uh, um, yeah, that's, I guess that's why it's a chicken and egg uh, situation. You know, we, what we see is that uh, the, um, over the years, workers and farmers have lost any sort of power and voice to go to the bargaining table and, you know, to, to get uh, a fair price or fair conditions or fair contracts. So be because they lost that, that kind of power and that voice, um, they also are losing economically. Uh, so I think um, th that's why I guess the campaign, uh, the Behind the Barcodes campaign is trying to, to tackle both of them at once. You know, you go from, uh, from the supermarkets and uh, try to improve the, the, the conditions and the terms of contracts with workers and farmers, but at the same time also um, increasing those channels where uh, workers and farmers can have more voice and more power. So I, I, I personally think you need to, to work at the same time with both of them, they're too intertwined, but personal It would be too easy to say it was one and the other, wouldn't it? Tutti, do you have anything, <laughs> anything to add on that one or what? You're, you're giving a thumbs up there? I'm giving a thumbs up. An example, <laughs> an example that I often give is, is you know, today, I might have been uh, hungry and I might have been discriminated against as a woman. And nobody in this world has a right to decide for me which one was worse. It might well be that for me, what was worse was to be discriminated on. Maybe mm. everybody around me is hungry. Maybe that's more acceptable to me. It has grown to be more acceptable. But maybe I feel what was particularly insulting today was that I was discriminated against. So, so I, I fully agree. This, I, I, I was speaking perhaps in a bit... Um, um, I guess what fair trade is sometimes uh, what, we are, what we are working on at the moment is, you know, living incomes is actually not codified in human rights conventions. Living wages is clearly a human right. It is clearly codified that a worker needs to have living wage. If, if a person who is working as employed is not getting a wage that is sufficient for their food and housing and, and schooling of their kids and a little bit saving for a bad day's, uh, for a bad, case of a bad day, then, then that's a violation of human rights. But there's, it's, it's, it's hazy. It's a, it's, it's a little bit unclear whether that also goes for smallholder farmers Mm -hmm. who are working in a global supply chain, who are completely dependent on that trader, uh, uh, sh sh shouldn't, I mean, these, these workers have a right to a decent standard of living. And we know that in these poor countries, their standard of living is fully dependent on the prices that they get. Uh, there is no social security system. So we think living incomes should be recognized as a human right, clearly. And, and we think we need to f sort of, we need to raise that issue. It's, it's an important issue. Uh, so that's what, that maybe influenced my speak a little, but. No, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's <laughs> the excellent and correct answer rather than chicken or egg. Um, we've yeah. got a couple of questions coming in. So I've, I'm, I'm going to put Vicky's question to you, Monica. Because um, I think it's a really interesting one. Um, do you think consumer pressure has played a role in retailers taking more action to address human rights issues in their supply chains? Uh, what do you think about that? 
Um, yeah, definitely. More consumer awareness helped. And, uh, you know, when uh, there are studies and polls that show that uh, consumers are more uh, um, keen, you know, to, uh, to make sure that their food comes uh, from ethical sources in an ethical way. Um, however, it's not always so a clear cut because then, um, then, you know, you see also trending markets where consumers go to low prices and uh, we know that those low prices come to a cost so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't stress so much I think it's important the public awareness and the consumer pressure as much as possible but I wouldn't bet on it <laughs> so much I think we need to go for other venues most likely maybe not the mainly and I, I sort of wonder Tutti connected to that you know recently in the UK we've been talking about the deforestation bill um, which has come come into the UK um, UK Parliament, um, and it's interesting that's focused on deforestation. And one of the things fair trade has been saying is, well, hold on a second, you can't just talk about deforestation without talking about about human rights. Do you think the kind of public, so instead of public as consumer, but public as citizen pressure influences legislation like deforestation uh, legislation, human rights legislation? Of course, it does. Of course it does. I don't think the UK would also would have a modern slavery act if legislation wasn't influenced by 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 a sort of a peak in a topical issue that okay th this sounds really bad modern slavery no 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 we have to do something about that. I think what the modern slavery act has taught us is that it may not be wise to to have laws that <sighs> Um, I don't know that, 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 that it's, it's not practical. If you look at it from, from the point of view of people and the environment and also the companies, uh, we, we need laws that are more practical than focusing on a narrow issue, just one human right or one environmental issue. What we are expecting, what, what companies have started doing as well, is this whole process of, of understanding how their operations and supply chains impact people and the environment, identifying what the biggest problems are, then addressing those biggest problems. Why would we meddle, med, meddle with that process by saying, and then you must find deforestation and modern slavery to be the issues for, the, for you? No. They, not, they are not always those issues. Sometimes the biggest human rights and environmental problems are something else than deforestation and modern slavery. And, and we should rather have laws that concern a wider section of human rights and environmental issues, but are really quite clear on the process that companies are expected to do. And also, quite clear that companies are expected to do rights dialogue with rights holders. Rights holders mean all those people in your operations and supply chains that might be adversely impacted, you know, might. So, so that, that dialogue uh, should be expected. Um, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, uh, I, I hope the legislators have, have seen that Modern Slavery Act is, is not the be all and end all and maybe it's, a, it's, a, it's time to look in, in, a, in, a, in a more comprehensive manner. Look a bit further. Um, mm. There's a few, a few very interesting, what I'm going to say is, is sort of pra practical operational kind of considerations Good. being asked about here. Um, so Rianne is asking about, which I think is a really interesting question, because it's also about power in supply chains, which is, what do you think of the efforts of international traders in gathering pharma data to comply with due diligence versus helping pharma organisations themselves to gather and manage this data? Um, and I guess, you know, there's a specific thing in there, but I guess there's also a general question in there about who... Who, who owns the assets, the data, the technology, who has access to these, these tools when, when we're looking at supply chains? Because the, the, another question from Catherine around satellite imagery, geospatial data, 
um, what role that might play in um, data collection for transparency. Um, Tuti, then maybe Monica, you'd like to give a view on that. I mean, these are quite, these, you either know about these things or you don't. I mean, I know nothing about these things, but uh, Tuti, what, what, what do you think on these topics? Um, if we want to tackle the human rights and environmental problems in the supply chains, what we need is collaboration. We need co-investment by all the companies in the supply chain. And you will not get that if you just try to get data or information for yourself to police others. Uh, we all need data, we all need information, but it has to be shared. Uh, that's the bottom line. And then I think the next step is um, uh, getting data from workers and farmers through some mobile phone gadgets is unlikely to be better than than people local people who know the circumstances uh, setting up systems uh, although yeah yeah so so my my words are we need collaboration and co-investment that's essential without them nah well, that, I mean, you don't have it. Monica, what's your, what's your experience on this one? What's your, what's your, you must have seen a lot of these dynamics play out in your, in your experience. Yeah, no, I completely agree with Tutti. And uh, I was just thinking uh, a few years ago, I was doing some research on the beef supply chain in Brazil and uh, in the Amazon in Brazil. And um, I don't know where they are at now, actually. I lost a little bit uh, touch with them, but that was one of the key was to create this um, general database where all the companies and the suppliers could put the, the information data that then the government and the companies, everybody could access. And only like that you could have reliable data because otherwise it was, it was getting very messy in terms of um, sources of data and limits of lands. It, it's very technical and complicated, but the point was that if they didn't collaborate all together to do it, it was no, not going to to work and it, uh, the access from everybody also was key. So I, I just completely agree with, with Tutti in, uh, and the co-creation, you know, from the rights holders uh, aspect of it, you know, this idea that we're just going and extract information uh, is just too much. <laughs> Again, you know, like the, there have been years of audits that have been doing that with no results. So let's do something that's more meaningful that at the same time maybe can install some capacity uh, at the local level and, and gives, um, you know, important, uh, important data and information that it's reliable. And, and Monica, would you extend that principle to this question around, you know, technologies like satellite imagery, geospatial data, it may well be that the investment required to uh, access these things is the kind of investment that, that, you know, big intermediary traders or, you know, big businesses are able to access rather than your smallholder farmers. It, can I assume from what you said that you think that's also most valuable when it's shared in, in as part of those collaborations? Is that is that your sense? Yeah, that would be my yeah. I, I think it should be shared. Yeah, that would be my. Okay. okay, we've got one minute left. So in in a second, I'm going to ask you guys to give us your your final thought, um, and that can be a hope, a hope for the future in this field, or a development that you, you you're excited about. Um, to leave our audience with, or indeed a call to action, something you'd like to see see businesses do. Uh, while you're thinking about that, I'm um, just going to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, if you'd like to find out more about fair trade and what we're doing in this field, um, please do sign up to our, our newsletter or follow us on LinkedIn. Bridget's going to pop the link in, into the chat box um, and do get in touch with us if you'd like to learn more. You'll also be the first to hear about um, the next in our webinar series. Um, I'm not sure we're doing another one before Christmas. There might be a Christmas special. Um, but thank you all very much for joining us. And of course, we'll be sharing out the recording um, afterwards. And there is one question that we didn't get around to answering about the tea standard consultation, Sabita. So we'll come back directly to you um, with an answer to that. Um, so to wrap us up today, um, firstly, Tuti, to you, um, what's your kind of final thought for us? Um, my final thought is that uh, it, it, I'm so hopeful. It really seems like there is a new era of partnerships. Uh, and I'm really glad that you came to our webinar. Uh, you know, Fairtrade wishes to be a partner in certification, but also in programs and in advocacy 
and awareness raising for all kinds of stakeholders, including companies. So, so yeah, let's do this together. <laughs> That's very good. Very nice final thought. And Monica, last word to you. Yeah, I'm going to be a little bit more challenging. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really hopeful too. And as I say, we, I've been seeing the, an improvement and a trend of, uh, of, uh, of progress among companies, especially the food retailers that I've been engaging with for the campaign. But we did hit a wall with one specific thing. It's companies need to review their own buying practices because they have direct consequences on the farmers and workers that produce our food. And they're not doing that <laughs> in our campaign and in the scorecard, the assessment that we make of policies. That's the area where they're not making any changes. So now that I have an audience, also companies, it's like really, this is something that you can control. Some things you cannot control, but there are some things that you can change individually as a company. So please review your buying practices and see what direct effect they have on workers and, uh, and farmers. And this, is, this goes directly related to what we were saying before, these silos of buying team and sustainability teams. You know, there, is, well, there has been training or commercial teams, but not changing in how incentives are structured for the buying teams, you know, bonuses and things like that. So I think that's the key area that is compliant within the control of companies where we could have more progress. And so far we haven't seen any. So... I hope to see more progress on that area. I love that as a call to action. That's, uh, yeah, music to my ears. So thank you both so, so much for today. I uh, really appreciate it. And, and thank you to everyone for listening. We'll, we'll wrap up now. Um, but you'll, yeah, you'll hear from us with the recording and a follow-up follow up post. So uh, thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of this. this thank uh, you for having Thanks a lot. Have a nice us. day. Thank you for everybody who came. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>